Tonight we're going to continue our study on the manifestation gifts which are listed in 1 Corinthians the 12th chapter verses 8 through 10. Now last week we studied the gifts of healings. If you were here last night, yes I pronounced it right. It doesn't sound right but that's what it is. It's plural in the original Greek. It's gifts, plural, of healings, plural. Well, that's what we studied last week. So tonight, we're moving on to the next gift that's on the list, which is the working of miracles. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Instead of reading verses 8 through 10, which is the list, we're going to start in verse number 7 to keep it in context. So we'll read verses 7 through 10. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Now, if you really want to understand the working of miracles, you have to realize that this gift is referring to a specific type of miracle. You see, this gift is not just the gift of miracles, but it's a specific type of miracle. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. If you look up the word miracle in the Webster's Dictionary, you'll find this definition. It's an event that contradicts scientific laws, which is to say, a supernatural event. In other words, Webster's Dictionary defines any supernatural event as a miracle. So anything supernatural is considered to be a miracle. And if you think about that, that's true. If you see anything that's supernatural, anything that contradicts the, the natural laws or the physical laws, what do you say? Well, that's a miracle. I thought of something funny, but I thought, no, it might not be appropriate, so I won't go there. Now, according to Webster's de definition of a miracle, every one of the gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians the 12th chapter could be classified as a working of miracles because they're all supernatural. A word of knowledge is a supernatural impartation of facts in which the individual has no way of knowing or learning by natural means. In other words, it's something where someone knows something, a secret of someone else's heart, something that person's never shared, something that uh, they've never revealed to anyone. It's just that God revealed it. If you've ever had a word of knowledge, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it seems that God allows me to operate in this gift more than any of the other gifts. I can remember the very first time that I operated in this gift. I was preaching in a little church in Salas, Oklahoma. The pastor asked me that after I preached, would I mind uh, actually being down there and praying for people during the altar call time. If you don't remember the old altar call times. But anyways, people came down to the front and I can remember the very first time. I experienced to get to word of knowledge. I came to this person that I'd never seen before. You know, I think the only time I'd ever been to Salas Hall was to see a high school football game. And immediately I knew something about this person. Well, I really didn't know much about the get to word of knowledge. And I thought, what in the world? I said, let me ask you a question. And I asked this in such a way, the question in such a way that I was actually telling her what I knew about her. She just broke down in tears, prayed for her, moved on to the next one. All of a sudden, I just knew something. And I went down about six or seven people. Well, people, that's supernatural. So that would be classified as a miracle. A word of wisdom is the Holy Spirit supernaturally giving you wisdom in order to instruct you in what to do. So when it happens, it's a miracle. The gift of faith is a supernatural endowment by the Spirit to believe for something that's beyond your maturity level. If you've ever had or have ever experienced the gift of faith, it's kind of phenomenal. Because you know you really don't have the faith. You have not built your faith to the point where you can believe for this. But you just know that you know that this is going to happen and this is the way it's going to happen. And then as soon as it does happen, it's like that faith is gone and you're wondering, how in the world was I ever able to believe for that? Well, it was a supernatural faith. That's classified as a miracle. The gifts of healings are supernatural anointings of God to heal a particular sickness or ailment. So they're miracles. Prophecy, tongues, and tongues and interpretation are all supernatural, so they would be considered miracles. But here's my point. If the working of miracles signifies miracles in general, then Paul really didn't need to list a separate gift of miracles because all of these gifts are technically miracles. But 
Paul was referring to a specific type of miracle when he listed this gift. And we know this for two reasons. First of all, Paul listed this gift as a distinct gift. The word distinct means separate and different. So by listing this as a distinct gift, Paul was pointing out that this is a separate gift and it's different than the other gifts. Secondly, Paul used a specific Greek word to describe this gift. You see, the Greeks had four different words to describe miracles. And each Greek word represented a different type of miracles. Let me give you an example to illustrate what I'm talking about. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse number 22. If you don't know why this book is called Acts, because it's, it basically is kind of a recording of the Acts of the Apostles. What happened during this early church period of time? And so we're actually getting to see these acts, and that's what it means. But here's Acts chapter 2, verse number 22. This is part of a sermon. It says, people of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him. In other words, through Jesus, as you well know. Now, miracles, wonders, and signs are not synonyms. They are translated from different Greek words, and they describe different types of miracles. So let's look at each of the four Greek words, and let me show you the difference between them. And I'm talking about the Greek words, not the English words, because sometimes you'll hear a pastor talking about this, and they'll say, wonders is different than mighty works of power, and that's different from signs. Well, actually, you don't know what they are until you go to the original language. So I'm talking about the Greek words, not the English words. And all the translations are a little bit different. That's why I recommended that you get a Strong's. We sell them in our bookstore. And I also recommend, recommended that you get a Vines. So that if you want to know, well, what word was used here, you can go and look. All right. The first Greek word for miracles is thaumasios. Thaumasios is a term for general miracles that caused astonishment or wonder. In other words, people were amazed. A good example is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 14 and 15. Go ahead and turn there if you don't mind, and let me read this. It says, The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. The leading priest and the teachers of the religious law saw these wonderful miracles. Now that phrase is going to come from one Greek word, Thaumasios. And he heard even the children in the temple shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. But the leaders were indignant. Now, the people were amazed at what Jesus was doing because they could see the physical transformation taking place right before their eyes. They could see these people being healed, and they were amazed. They were astonished. They were in wonder. And that's why it's referred to as a Thaumasios miracle. It's because it makes people, it, it, it makes them astonished. They're amazed by what happens. But it also doesn't mean that they were just blown away. It's just that they were amazed. It's like, wow. But it's not a, as we're going to find out, a huge wow. It's just a wow. The second Greek word for miracles is samion. Samion refers to a miraculous sign. These are miracles performed as a sign to validate a claim. A good example it's also found in the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. Notice what it says. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Now, that's really not a good translation because that word would should have been translated, we want to. What they were saying is, Master, we want to see a sign from thee. And the word master, you need to understand that they really referred to any rabbi as master. And the reason they did... It's not like what we would think, a servant to a master, but basically it's kind of like a graduate degree. You get a master's degree. Supposedly they had mastered certain principles of the Bible. They had mastered certain aspects of the law, so they're referred to as master or teacher. It's a title of honor. So they're coming in and they're showing this honor to him, but really they don't believe in him. So they come to him and they say, Master. We want to see a sign from thee. But he answered and he said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, the resurrection was the sign 
that Jesus was the Messiah. They wanted to see a sign. They wanted to say, validate your claim that you truly are who you say you are. And Jesus said, you're evil and you're adulterous. If you just watched what I'm doing, what I'm teaching, what I'm saying, if you just study the messianic prophecies, you would know who I am. You want a sign? The only sign that's going to be given is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, and then he was spit up on the land, so I will be in the grave for three days and three nights, and I'll be resurrected. That was the sign that validated his claim that he was the Messiah, the seed of the woman. Moses' miracles before the Pharaoh were also considered to be signs. If you go back into the Old Testament, you can't look at the Hebrew because they're different words, but you can look at what is known as the Septuagint. And that's where they translated the Hebrew into Greek because that was the common language of the day. So even before Christ, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek and it's called the Septuagint. When you go back and you look at what Moses did, what he performed were signs to the Pharaoh to validate the claim that he had been sent by God to pull his people out of Egypt. The third Greek word for miracles is teros. Teros describes a miraculous event that causes reverence and fear. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 9 is a great example of a teros miracle. Notice what it says. The coming of the lawless one. Now who is the lawless one? I want to make sure everyone understands what this is talking about. The Antichrist, Satan's working through him. It says the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be in accordance with how Satan works. So Satan's working through him, Terry. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. Now the word wonders is translated from the Greek word teros. So what this is telling us is that when the Antichrist comes, he's going to perform all types of signs and wonders. Some of the miracles that he performs will be seen as a sign, a samion, we're going to find out that that's the word used there, that he is who he claims to be. He is the al-Mahdi, or as the Shiites would say, he's the 12th imam. So when the 12th imam comes, or I should say the Antichrist comes, the Muslim world is going to recognize him as the al-Mahdi. The Shiites are going to say that he's the 12th imam. But the way he's going to, to validate His claim that he is who he claims to be is through these miracles that are going to be signs. He's also going to perform, though, what is meant to strike fear in the hearts of the people. He's going to perform teros miracles. That's where the word wonders comes in. But this teros miracles will make people fear him. So we need to understand when the Antichrist comes, he's going to do some wonderful miracles. And people are going, "Ah, he has to be the Ahmadi. So if you're here, just let me say this. If someone's pulling off some unbelievable miracles and the Muslim world is running after him and he's doing these signs that uh, validate his claim to be uh, the Al-Mahdi or the 12th Imam, I want you to understand that uh, you've been left behind. Anyways, the last Greek word for miracles is dunamis. Our English word dynamite comes from this Greek word. Now, when this word is used to refer to miracles, it actually means miraculous acts of power. You see, these type of miracles are the mightiest and the most spectacular of the four types of miracles. In fact, the Greek word dunamis is usually translated as mighty works or simply as power. But not what we think of power. You know, we've kind of grown up in a day, if you played sports, where weightlifting is something that you do if you want to play sports. You should have grew up when I grew up, because when I was in junior high, you still had coaches that were thinking, maybe you didn't want to lift weights because you might be muscle-bound. How many of you are old enough to remember that? You know, there were certain sports they wanted you to lift weights in, and it was like football or wrestling. But then if you played basketball or baseball, they didn't want you to lift weights because you would be muscle-bound. And then all of a sudden that all shifted and it's like, "Mm, you're not going to get muscle bound, that's just stupid. It's kind of like when we did two-a-days and they didn't even give you water. They'd come out and give you ice. It's a wonder we didn't die. And a few people did, but you didn't have this national news like you have today. So I kind of like to go back and study it. 
But it's amazing. But all of a sudden things have changed and now everyone's lifting weights and now they're into power lifting. And so we've kind of diminished this word power. But you need to understand when we talk about power in the Bible, we're talking about dynamite. We're talking about explosive power. Did you like that? Anyways. A good example of dunamis, again, is found in Mark chapter 6, verse number 5. Notice what it says. Now, he could do no mighty work there. Where is there? Does anyone know? In his hometown. Yeah, Nazareth. Whoever said that is right. When he went back to his hometown, it says, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. The phrase mighty work is translated from the Greek word dunamis. He couldn't do any powerful works there. Now, the Bible makes a distinction between these four types of miracles, which tells us that we should make a distinction between them too. The Bible does not use these four words as synonyms. Whenever it lists them, it's listing them for a reason. And if you do not make a distinction between these four Greek words, you're going to get in trouble. Especially when you study in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, how to operate in these gifts and the rules that apply. Some of you grew up in Pentecostal churches or full gospel churches, and you saw many times things going crazy. Why? Because they didn't operate in the gifts according to the, the rules that were laid down by the Apostle Paul, and that was given to him by God. Because God does everything decently in order. There's always a purpose for it. And the problem is most of us don't know the purpose, but the reason we don't know the purpose is because we don't make a distinction between these four types of miracles. And so when we're going through 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, and he starts telling us the rules that we're supposed to use when we operate in these gifts, he explains why. Because he's given us the purpose of these gifts. Okay, I'm getting off. But anyways... All I'm trying to tell you is that the Bible makes a distinction between these four types of miracles, so we should make a distinction between them. Look back at Acts chapter 2, verse number 22 again, and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Here again is part of the speech. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. Now again, when he says, Miracles, wonders, and signs, these are not synonyms. The phrase powerful miracles actually comes from the Greek word dunamis. The word wonders comes from the word terrorist. It produces reverence. Jesus did certain things that created reverence. And then, of course, signs, Samion, and those basically validated his claims as being the Messiah. So these aren't synonyms, these are different types of miracles, and they have different purposes. Some are supposed to just amaze. Some cause you to reverence or fear. Some validate a claim. Now I know. And then others are just jaw-dropping, dunamis. Let me give you one more example. We're going to go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 9. This gives you a little bit of insight about the Antichrist. Here's what it says. The coming of the lawless one, again, that's the Antichrist, will be in accordance with how Satan works. In other words, you want to know how Satan works? You're going to get a good example when the Antichrist comes on the scene. He will use all sorts of displays of power. Now that phrase, displays of power, comes from one Greek word. That whole phrase, dunamis. What it's saying is, he will use all sorts of displays of power, dunamis. Through signs, samion, which means these displays of power are going to validate his claim that he is who he says he is. Of course, we're going to know he is who he says he is, but it's not who he really is. That might not have made sense to you. But he's going to say that he's the ruler. And he is for a brief time, is what the Bible says. That brief time, God gives him a brief time to actually rule and reign on this world. And he's going to do these wonderful things to validate his claim that he's this person who will do that. 
He'll also do wonders, and these wonders will serve the lie. Here's what's interesting. We look at this and say, wonders that serve the lie. In fact, if you have the King James Version, I think it says lying wonders. They want to have their King James Version open? Does it say that? What does it mean by that? It means that he's going to do things that strikes fear in the hearts of people. And even if they don't want to serve him, they're going to serve him because they fear him. And they're going to revere him because of these miracles that he does. But you see, all three of these are different miracles and types of miracles. And they serve a different purpose. Now, knowing that, turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 10. And we're going to focus on the gift known as the working of miracles. Notice what verse 10 says. To another, because he's listing these gifts, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Now, which Greek word do you suppose that Paul used here in verse number 10 for miracles? Teros, Damasios, Semion, Dunamis. Which one do you think? Dunamis. Dunamis. So this gift is really the working of miraculous acts of power. I'm not good at sounds. I'm trying to give you that power. But anyways, now listen to me. This gift, the working of miracles, this gift does not include all types of miracles. I said not. This gift does not include all types of miracles as I've said repeatedly, it only includes one specific type of miracle. In fact, it only includes what theologians refer to as miraculous acts of power. And that's why the working of, mis of miracles is a distinct gift. In other words, it is a separate gift and it's different from all the other gifts. Think about this. All the other gifts are considered to be miraculous. But they are not dunamis miracles. I'm pausing to let you think about that. All of the other gifts are by definition miracles. If you've ever experienced the word of knowledge and someone, know, someone actually knows one of the secrets of your heart, something you haven't even told your spouse, no one knows this, and they reveal one of the secrets of your heart, you go, ooh. There's no way you could have known that. That was God. That's a miracle, but that's not a dunamis miracle. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom, prophecy, discernment of spirits, all of those things are miracles. But you need to understand something. They fall into the category of either Thaumasios, Samion, or Teros miracles. They are not dunamis miracles. Now, let me show you why the other gifts are not considered to be the working of miracles, even though they're miraculous. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let's read verses 24 through 25. But if all of you are prophesying, and unbelievers are people who don't understand these things come into your meaning, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed. And they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring God is truly here among you. Now, I want you to notice he's talking about prophecy. And he's saying when you prophesy, the secrets of their hearts are going to be exposed through that prophecy. And when the secrets of their hearts are exposed, they're going to do certain things. They're going to fall to their knees and begin to worship God. And they're going to declare that God is truly here among you. Now, prophecy usually includes the gift of word of knowledge and the gift of word of wisdom. It doesn't have to, but normally it does. If you've ever been prophesied to, you know that many times they'll be prophesying, and in that, God will reveal something. You're thinking, how in the world did they know that? They didn't. This is of God. Because it's a word of knowledge. And, and then it also includes also words of wisdom. Now, it doesn't have to, but most of the time, true prophecy will include also the other two gifts, the gift of word of knowledge and gift of word of wisdom. Now, I want you to notice in verse number 25 that these gifts produce astonishment and awe. That's why they declare that God is truly here. Because when a person's being prophesied and the secrets of their heart are exposed, and they think, no one knew that. 
No one knows that. How did you know that? All of a sudden, there's astonishment and awe. Wow. It also produces reverence and fear. Think about that. What else do they do? They fall to their knees and they worship God. Why would you fall to your knees? Let me tell you, you don't fall to your knees. That's not something we do. You're in here worshiping. You fall to your knees when you're humbled. You fall to your knees when all of a sudden it just kind of comes over you that this is God. How dare you stand in his presence? So there's this reverence. There's this fear. Now, compare their responses to the definition of thaumasios and teros. Thaumasios, as I told you, is a general miracle that it causes astonishment or wonder. And again, that's why they declare that God is here. He's truly in this place. Why? Because they're astonished at what, what was said. Teros is a miraculous event that causes reverence and fear. And that's why they fall to their knees and worship God. It's out of reverence and fear. So as you can see, prophecy, a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom are considered to be miracles, but not dunamis miracles. They fall under the category of Thaumasios and Teros miracles because they produce astonishment and fear. People are astonished when their secrets are revealed. And there's a reverence that comes over them that, wow, God, this is amazing. But it's not a dunamis miracle. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 22. So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign. Not a sign for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Now, as you can plainly see, verse number 22 states, the tongues is a sign. And the word sign is translated from the Greek word samion. In other words, it is a miracle performed as a sign to validate a claim. And you're probably looking at the verse and saying, now what? Tongues is a sign to validate a claim? Yeah. In the early church, tongues was a sign to the Jews that the Holy Spirit had fallen upon the Gentiles. And it validated their claim that they were saved without being circumcised and without obeying the Mosaic law. You see, there were a lot of Pharisees that believed in Jesus, but they didn't believe the gospel that Paul was preaching. The gospel that Paul was preaching was one of grace. The gospel that Paul was preaching is that Jesus has fulfilled the law. You are no longer underneath the ceremonial law. Now, the moral law is still in effect, and most people don't understand that. What's the moral law? The moral law is, thou shalt not murder. Let me tell you something. Murder was wrong before Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, but it's still wrong after Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected. Lying was wrong before Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, and it's still wrong today. Rape, incest, premarital sex, the, the moral law is still in effect today. God's told us what's right and wrong. But the ceremonial law is no longer in effect. What's the ceremonial law? The ceremonial law is how we approach God and how we become righteous. Jesus fulfilled that part of the law. I no longer have to go sacrifice a lamb, a goat, a bullock. Why? Because Jesus was the sacrifice for all time. He died for my sin. The way I approach God is through Jesus Christ. Now, Paul comes along and he begins to teach that we're saved by grace, not by being circumcised and obeying the Mosaic law. And you've got these Pharisees that see Jesus resurrected. They believe that he's the Messiah, but they go, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, in order to be saved, you must be circumcised and you must obey the Mosaic law. And Paul's saying that's not true. So you have these unbelievers coming in. Now, most of you go, going, now, wait a minute. I thought these unbelievers were Gentiles. Now, you need to understand something about the pagans. The pagans, priests, and all of these ungodly pagan religions, most of their priests had these ecstatic utterances. They were commonplace. These demons would take control of them, and they would babble in these, what they considered to be tongues back then. But you see, the early church saw what happened on Pentecost. You had these believers, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them in the upper room, but they were all Jews. Remember what happened when Peter goes, and he begins to preach to the Gentiles. Man, the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and they're astonished. 
they're not circumcised. They don't keep the Mosaic law. This is a sign of what? This is a sign that the Holy Spirit has come upon them. They're saved by grace and not by works. Paul's going out and preaching this. And where does he usually preach? He begins in the synagogues. Here they're at Corinth. Most of the people that are coming in are Jews. And what are they wanting them to do? They're wanting these people who believe in Jesus and are coming in. Oh, yes, yes, Jesus is good, but you need to be circumcised. And you need to keep the, you need to keep the Mosaic law. So they come to the church and they see these Gentiles. And they're speaking in tongues. Just like what happened in Jerusalem in the upper room. And they go, wait a minute. I don't get this. This guy is a pagan. He's not even a God-fearer. god fear is someone who wasn't circumcised, but at least tried to keep a part of the Mosaic law. These people weren't even that. But he's coming in and he's saying that tongues is a sign. It's a semion. It validates a claim. And what's the claim? That you're saved by grace, not by faith. I'll tell you what always amazes me. What amazes me is sometimes the people that operate more in the gifts are the ones that first get saved. And sometimes, man, they were the most ungodliest, immoral people. And it's like, whew. what's that a sign of? It's a sign that you're saved by grace. It's not by works, lest any men should boast. I've gotten off, sorry. Not in my notes. Probably scared everyone back there. Anyways, my point is this. All of the other spiritual gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12 are considered to be miracles when they occur, but they're not dunamis miracles. Is everyone with me? Now, having said all of that, let me define the gift of miracles. You ready for the definition? If you're taking notes, write this down. The gift of miracles is a miraculous act of power. That's it. And the emphasis in this definition is on power. Or in other words, mighty miracles. By definition, it refers to big miracles as opposed to little miracles. You see, the Bible makes a distinction. Sometimes we just want to put everything, if it's supernatural, they're all miracles. And we look at this and go, well, they're all miracles. The Bible makes a distinction between little miracles, yeah, that's a miracle, and big miracles. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You ever not known how you're going to pay a bill, and you're tithing, and you're believing God, and then all of a sudden you go out to the mailbox, and you pull out the mail, and oh man, got something from the insurance company, oh, another bill, God, you know I can't pay, I've been praying for this. You open it up, and it goes, oh, we got in trouble. We have to pay every one of our people this amount. You got a $300 check. And what did you say? <gasps> it's a miracle. Might be. Let's be honest. That's a little miracle. That's not a big miracle. And the Bible makes a distinction between big miracles and little miracles. And let me give an example to illustrate what I'm talking about. Turn to Mark chapter 6, verse number 5. We're going to read this again. We've already read it, but I want you to see what it's actually saying. It says, and because of their unbelief, talking about Nazareth, he couldn't do any, any mighty miracles among them, except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Now, the phrase mighty miracles is translated from the Greek word dunamis. So what this verse is actually saying is that because of their unbelief, Jesus couldn't do any big miracles just a few small ones, like healing the sick. Now, wouldn't you like to be in a place where you're seeing so many miracles that when Jesus heals the sick, it's like, well, that's just little miracles. That's little. Wait till you see him walk on water. Wait till you see him raise the dead. Man, Lazarus has been in there so long, Lord, he stinketh by now. Those are big miracles. Now, let me give you some biblical examples of the working of miracles so you'll know the difference between little miracles and dunamis miracles. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 13, 13 through 14. Elijah picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he was taken up. Then Elijah returned to the bank of the Jordan River. Those of you who went with us to Israel, Jordan River's not that big. It's more like a creek. 
Certain places it's deep, but boy, I'm telling you, in the springtime, this is when it would have occurred, it gets to rolling. Think of the Illinois River. You can look at the Illinois River in August, there hadn't been much rain. It's like, is that really a river? Go when it's flooding. Try to get across the Illinois River then. But notice what it says. Elijah picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when it was taken up. Then Elijah returned to the bank of the Jordan River. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the river divided. In the Hebrew, it means it split. Wow. It split. And Elijah went across. Or Elijah went across. Now, you need to really think about this. Because this thing splits. And you know what happens when you walk out in the middle of the river and you say, okay, I'm going to dam this up. And you take out a, a four by eight piece of plywood and you stick it down. You stand against that current. Do you stop the river? No, it just goes right around you if it doesn't knock you over. And he split the river. Where did it go? It just stopped. Stopped flowing. And he walked across. Look at Exodus chapter 14, verses 21 through 22. This is even bigger. I tell you, if you ever get a chance to go to Egypt, I know it's in turmoil right now, but go to the Sinai Peninsula and you cross the Red Sea. And then you go, actually, we, we actually went up the Gulf of Aqaba. I'm telling you, that's amazing, beautiful. And there's one place where you can look at, and you can see, okay, this is Saudi Arabia, this is Egypt, there's a little point that's Israel, and that's Jordan. It's kind of neat because you can see four countries right here. Now, here's what most people don't realize. Scholars believe that Mount Sinai was not in, or I shouldn't say scholars, majority of scholars believe that Mount Sinai is not in the Sinai Peninsula. It's actually in Saudi Arabia. And you can't go there because they actually have a fence around it because the top of the mountain's blackened, and there's good evidence that that's actually the true Mount Sinai. So what they did is they came through the Mount Sinai, and they got to the Gulf of Aqaba. And when you look at the Gulf of Aqaba, we're talking wide, Mississippi River ride. Wider than that. And Moses comes up, and he raises his hand over the sea, the Gulf of Aqaba. And the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. Can you imagine walking? You see these walls of water, and there's fish. I, this is just me. Of course, my wife would be pulling me along saying, don't. I'd be wanting to stick my hand in it. Anyone else? People, that's a miracle. But, but we're not talking little. You've got to check in the mail. We're talking dunamis miracles. Miraculous acts of power. Now, those are two Old Testaments. So now we go to the New Testament. Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 12. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin, just touched his skin, were placed on sick people, they were healed of the diseases, and evil spirits were expelled. Romans chapter 1, verse number 4. And he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power. The word power? Dunamis. Could have also been translated by the miracle of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. To raise the dead is a working of miracles. But to be dead for three days and three nights, and by now your body stinks, and to be raised from the dead. Now people, that's a miracle. So what I'm telling you is that even though all of the gifts of the Spirit that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 are miraculous, the working of miracles is distinct. It's a different gift. It's separate. It's completely different. It's set apart because it produces mightier and more spectacular miracles. In other words, bigger and more powerful miracles. People, we're talking about raising the dead. And I could have used so many examples in the Bible. Raising Lazarus from the dead. As we said, the river's parting. Feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. Later on, feeding 4,000 people. Walking on water. All of these things. But what I want you to understand is there's a difference between these spiritual gifts, and they are miraculous. But we don't see very often this. But they still happen today. You know, one of the missionaries that our church supports is Doug Dennis. 
And he's in a, and he's in a land where there's actually tribes that never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he goes to some of these tribes and when he goes up the river, he can't even get off the boat because the uh, country doesn't allow it. They don't want these tribes to be tainted. Uh, they want the culture to stay intact. But he can preach the gospel standing on the, on, on the boat. And he travels sometimes for days and he goes to these places. And sometimes he tells stories. About once a year, he comes back to America for a week or two. And uh, we'll meet him up in Tulsa. And he'll tell some of the most fantastic stories of people being dead and being raised from the dead. It still happens today. He talks about tribes that have never heard the gospel and he's getting ready to go to them. And, or he was getting ready to go to them. And he said before he even got there, some of the, one of the elders had actually had a dream. And the dream was this man was going to come and he was going to give the answer. And he, and he sets everything up and said, when I come, immediately he calls all the people and said, this is my dream. This is the guy. And the whole tribe. Here's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The majority of them get saved. People, miracles still happen today. I think one of the reasons they don't happen in America is the same reason that Jesus could do no mighty, work, mighty works of power in his hometown. It says because of their unbelief, he could do no mighty works except heal a few people. So we see the little ones. But one of the reasons I think it is is because we are so educated. We don't even expect it. We don't need it. We look to science. And there's nothing wrong with that. I told you when we talked gifts of healings. But people always come up to me and say, well, Alan, if that's real, why doesn't it happen in America? Why don't we see it? Because we are Nazareth. And it says when Jesus went to his hometown, he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief.